I have the privilege of sitting with Ime Archibald, the Director of Strategic Relationships at Facebook, to discuss his journey from software engineer at IBM to top executive at the most transformative social media platform in existence. Ime leads a team focused on accelerating Facebook's product, strategy, and unlocking new business opportunities through partnerships and product integrations. His team has worked on everything from the Facebook Manager app to a relatively new initiative called Internet.org, which aims to connect the world to the Internet. It is my pleasure to introduce Ime Archibong. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ime, thank you for coming to our Tech Connect Summit and to share your wisdom and what you're doing at Facebook. So, how many people have Facebook accounts? Uh, of course, we all do, right? <laughs> what about WhatsApp? <laughs> WhatsApp. Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> Messenger. <laughs> all right. Good, good. <laughs> so, Ime, you started your career at IBM. You left in 2010. 2010, yeah. And Facebook was created in 2004. Yeah. Why Facebook? It's an interesting journey. It's an interesting question, too. Uh, one, just thanks for having me here. You're welcome. It's, fun. It's, it's great to be here and see so many folks out here that are interested in tech. Um, my journey at IBM was fairly interesting. I started off as a software engineer. I did that for a number of years, actually down in Tucson, Arizona. and. It's one of those questions where I think we all have in our career at some point, whether you feel like what you're doing is having, uh, A, tapping into like where you truly are sure. uh, in your career and what the impact that you think that you can have. And I felt that as an engineer, while I was having impact at IBM, there was more for me to do and a bigger kind of role for me out there. So I actually transitioned at IBM from an engineer to corporate strategy. So I went from this company that was you know, 400,000 people strong in the trenches coding mm -hmm. to actually now sitting up top of this company looking down at kind of what the corporate strategy should look like for the next 10 years. I did that for a summer and then went and did business development when I was licensing uh, kind of storage system hardware and technology. And I was doing that actually out here in the Bay for about two years. The majority of the companies that I was working at were right up and down the valley and also in Asia. And I think, as anyone who's probably in this room has been in the Bay Area for a little while, being in technology in Silicon Valley, but working for a company that wasn't consumer tech focused, wasn't kind of a, known as like one of the internet powerhouses, right. you wonder whether you're really a part of the ecosystem mm -hmm. or not. And uh, while IBM was really, really good to me and I was having a great time there, I think I started to get curious and looking around and bounced around, looked for, I guess, say startups at the time. I was like, I just right. want anything smaller, but when you're at a 400,000 person company, anything is smaller. Sure. And was connecting with someone who uh, was probably planning on doing a startup, but Facebook had gobbled him up mm -hmm. by the time we actually sat down for a coffee and I described to him what I was looking for and what I wanted to do next in my career as an entrepreneur. He said, whoa, 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 before you go do that, let me talk to you about this company called Facebook and why it's special and what we're doing and how we only think that 1% of the, 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 the mission that we have set up is actually being done and that you can actually have a great career here. So. Good. So we understand that you're an avid runner. <laughs> yeah. Right? As of late. As of late? As okay. of late. As of late. Um, but you run sometimes in the mornings with Mark Zuckerberg, yeah, correct? I run, yeah. Yeah. On, on trips, yeah. On trips. So what is that like, the conversation, you yeah. know, and talking about what's the future of Facebook? Yeah. It's a great question. I, uh, it's funny to hear or have someone describe me as a runner. So I grew up a basketball player, and I used to hate running any farther than 90 feet to 90 feet, 45 feet, 45 feet. <laughs> but uh, a couple years ago, actually, one of the integrations that my team was working on for Facebook was a deep integration with Nike Plus. So if anyone is a runner out there, there's a great integration where you would connect your Facebook account to the Nike Plus account. As you're running, you get cheers in your ears from your friends and family. Mm -hmm. and it felt like you were on this personal marathon. Right. So. It worked for me. I was testing it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I like this feeling. I'm going to keep running. And that was probably four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I travel a lot for work, too. And a lot of the nature of the, the partnerships that we do are global. Mark travels a lot as, a, as kind of the CEO of the company. And we'd often find ourselves in the same location at the same time. And I think at some point, we discovered that we both like to run in order to defeat jet lag. So we started running together. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great kind of way that we're able to bond and, and communicate. Uh, and we talked, yes, about the company and what we're doing. 
a lot of the stuff that I'm focused on right now is, tends to be top of the mind for Mark. There's an internet.org initiative, which mm -hmm. I think you mentioned a little while ago. Right. Uh, I work and my team works with a number of startups and entrepreneurs and developers around the world, which is always uh, an ecosystem of partners that Mark is curious and keen to, to kind of engage with and learn from. So we often talk about that, but none of that, we, we try to stay fit together and, and defeat jet lag. <laughs> yeah. So you talked about um, global and your initiative with the internet.org. Tell us about you know, what you're actually doing specifically in Nigeria, Africa, sure. India, and yeah. those countries. Yeah. So um, uh, Facebook is a company that has 1.71 billion people right now uh, using it every single month, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. But the mission of Facebook is to connect the world, all right? to give people the power to share. And that doesn't mean stopping at 1 billion nor 2 billion. It's truly connecting the 7, 8 billion people that are on the planet. So when we started to look at what were the big barriers from us connecting the entire planet, connectivity jumps out as a major one. I mean, everyone in this room, uh, anyone who's probably in Silicon Valley and definitely in North America and Europe is on the internet, but we're the minority of the world right now. Right. Two thirds of the planet have never been on the internet. So internet.org was crafted about three years ago to try to figure out who we could partner with around the world to tackle, or tackle and kind of at, uh, attempt to break down these barriers of connectivity. There's a couple barriers that jumped out. One, infrastructure. So there are definitely areas of the planet where the current infrastructure which powers the internet or powers connectivity just can't exist. It's not cost effective. Um, there's awareness and there's affordability. So internet.org comprises a bunch of different programs we have a, I could go into depth talking about one called Free Basics where we work with mobile operators. Uh, we have a solar powered plane that we're testing out to put into the sky that will beam down the internet. Um, we're working on satellite technology to provide back end infrastructure uh, for the internet. But a bunch of these different initiatives and tactics that ultimately are all designed towards trying to break down the barriers of connectivity around the world and make sure the next four, four or five billion people can get online. Um, earlier we had a conversation with Stuart Butterfield about Slack. And we know that you have Facebook at work yeah. now, which is competition for Slack. Yeah. And so what has that been and what does the product actually do and you know, what is the future of that? Yeah, no, it's a great. Um, Facebook at work was one of those ones that I think that as a company we continue, or we will look at and we'll look back and say we continue to be proud of the ability to innovate and take an idea from incubation to testing to launching and actually truly see great market penetration and market value. Um, if you were to be a Facebook employee or if I was to bring out my phone right now and show you my news feed, which it sounds like a lot of people here love and, and scroll through, right. probably 50 or over 50% of my news feed is work related. Mm -hmm. Because since day one, Facebook has used Facebook as a productivity tool, and it's been incredible. When we started to institutionalize and truly have all of our employees lean into it, connect with each other, form groups around projects, using Messenger to kind of connect real time with people, we saw the amount of email traffic you know, that we were using, you know, Outlook or whatever it may be at the time, drop significantly at the company. And we've just found Facebook to be an incredible tool for, if you want to call it just enterprise or business processes. So we saw that, we said, hey, it shouldn't just be Facebook as a company benefiting from this. Let's see if we can extend this to other companies, other organizations, startups, or big Fortune 500 companies uh, to use this tool. 1.71 billion people are already using it and familiar with it. You saw everyone in this room kind of raising their hand. Um, so it felt like just like a natural transition and what you saw us launch and talk about yesterday was, hey, now it's now open to the world. Many companies have been using it for a couple months now. Mm -hmm. They are seeing great value in it. We wanna make sure that other folks feel like they can use Facebook as a good work productivity tool too. Earlier in the year, um, Butch Graves, our CEO, yeah. and I, in a a couple of other colleagues have come down to Facebook and you let us come into the campus in New York, yeah. if you will. And um, you talk to us about the opportunities that publishers have yeah. um, with using in Facebook. And one of the things was instant articles. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in general, one of the beautiful things about Facebook, um, you know, there's a bunch of different, I would say, pillars that make what we do special mm -hmm. uh, as a company. You know, there is the social graph, which you just talked about, kind of one point, you know, one, 1 1.7 billion people using it. There's a bunch of work that we've done in creating distribution channels, right? So you talk about the news, you talk about Messenger, talk about Instagram. Uh, the last, I would say, like core piece of the Facebook DNA, which, uh, you know, I was surprised actually on day one when I entered the company, but uh, nonetheless is something that I think keeps me really excited and it's, I'm, I'm proud that we hold on to this DNA, which is this 
platform approach that we have to every and anything that we build and do. And when you talk about platforms, there's a bunch of different, I would say, constituents that we're trying to serve. One is people, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. uh, advertisers, we're in the advertising business. Right. Uh, developers, which I just talked about, kind of the startups that are leveraging our APIs and our tools to build interesting products. And I know you guys have a hackathon here. I'd yes. be curious to see if any of them built using our APIs, which sure. would be great. Um, but an increasingly important one, are the publisher community, mm -hmm. right? They're seeing our distribution channels are as meaningful, whether it was traffic to their websites at some point. Um, you know, a lot of people these days are creating more content, video content, and leveraging the Facebook ecosystem to get that video content out there. Instant articles was definitely one of those ideas where we saw, gosh, you know, a lot of publishers are out there, you know, sharing links into Facebook. People are clicking on them. Uh, the user experience that goes from that click to actually consuming that content could be cleaned up. Let's lean mm -hmm. into this, figure out what the right experience right. should be. So if anyone is out there using instant articles, you'll now see that you know with that one click, you have kind of this beautiful canvas inside of Facebook that allows you to, to publish multimedia and also kind of the, the copy that uh, you know publishers know so well and have been doing for so well. So it's an attempt to, to build out a better user experience to create that or to consume that content for our shared stakeholder, which are yeah, people. Yeah, there are several um, brands or publishing companies that just use Facebook. Yeah. You know, instead of having a website, yeah. is that something that kind of started from there and you decided mm -hmm. or Facebook decided that we're going to use instant articles so people can come in and have that experience or that mm -hmm. exposure? Yeah, like I say, it's a little bit of both. It's the beauty of working uh, at, at a company where I would say people have been leaning into it for a number of years, developers, publishers, businesses, because you see the limitations of the platform because so many people have been created over the course, are creative over the mm -hmm. course of a number of years, trying to figure out how to, to, to hack it, right? You guys are the hackathon, how to right. hack it to serve their business needs. And when we see some of these hacks happening, that's where a lot of the innovation and creativity and ideas come from, right? We have that spark and we say, hey, oh, you know, publishers are, are are leaning into pages, and you know they're getting frustrated about you know how video is showing up or how their articles are showing up. Is there something that we can go and do to actually improve the experience, not only for that publisher, but then also clearly for our collective stakeholder, which are people? And um, yeah, that's the, you, the, the the hacking that's been happening on our our pro platform and products for a number of years often leads to some of the great product ideas that come out. Yeah, initially working, you know, and having an account on Facebook was more or less to keep in contact with your friends. Mm -hmm. But what I found lately is it's news, it's community, it's social. Yeah. Um, how does that work as far as calculating and culminating um, data um, for Facebook? Um. So I think you're right. Like the, I think everyone probably has their Facebook moment or their Facebook story of how they got on. Whether it, you know, if you were in college in 2004, it was probably someone ran into your dorm room and said, "Hey, there's this really cool service. You should hop on. You right. can connect with people are on the internet, and it's really them. It's not a, a fake person." <laughs> uh, if you joined a little bit later, maybe it was a friend or a family member uh, that, you know, "Hey, I'm going to start publishing my baby pictures here. Mom, you probably want to hop on and check it out." Um, so everyone has their story, and it's typically, it is the core of Facebook. It'll always be the core of Facebook, kind of people first, friends and family, and being able to connect with each other and, and kind of share stories. I would say that increasingly so, yes, you know, people are wanting to connect with the institutions that they were a part of, uh, smaller groups, and that's why the group's product, which is kind of one of these little known explosions on the internet, you know, with tens of millions of people every single month visiting a Facebook group of either kind of their high school friends, their college friends, uh, it could be a community organization. One of the things that blew our mind was we started looking into some of the activity that was happening in groups, and you're talking about businesses. Right. Uh, the island of Mauritius, there was, you know, a group where I think over 25% of the population in the entire country was in that Facebook group buying and selling from each other. Wow. So we see different use cases like this. Mm -hmm. Once again, people hacking, hacking the, right. the, the product mm -hmm. uh, that we then lean into and try to figure out how we can improve it for people. Uh, if they want to connect with businesses, let's do more there. We built Facebook pages, which tend to be a great mm -hmm. Chrome for businesses. Sure. You're seeing a lot of that happening in Messenger right now. Mm -hmm. um, I heard there was a conversation just a, a little while ago about AI, mm -hmm. and someone was talking about kind of the software components of AI, not just robotics and, sure. you know, our bots platform on Facebook Messenger, you know, over the course of just nine months has seen 
30,000 different bots being built by 30,000 different messenger businesses and services that are really keen on letting people just not talk to their friends and family, but also talk to KLM when I'm booking an airline or talk to right. Uber when I'm booking a ride or something along those lines. So it's, it's, uh, the evolution is going to be pretty interesting and cool. So we talked a lot about Facebook. About what? Facebook? Yes. Yeah. We talked a lot about it. Sure. But how about Instagram, IG? Uh -huh. you know, um, where are you going with that? Yeah, I mean, Instagram was, uh, and I, I don't even know kind of the exact tagline that they're using these days, but it's all about capturing the world's experiences, uh, initially in images, but then increasingly so in video. We're seeing this great trend that's happening across all of our different properties, and Instagram is no mystery to that, but just leveraging and leaning into the, 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 the idea and the fact that people like consuming video, like the sight, sound, and motion, and the powerful emotional experience you can get from that. Uh, has been incredible. So uh, with, with everyone having a video camera in their pocket these days to increase connectivity, and uh, it's just an opportunity, A, to like aggregate that content, making sure that we're displaying it and showing it in a beautiful way. Instagram has been doing a great thing. The community is now over 500 uh, you know, million people are using Instagram every single wow. day, which is fantastic. We're really excited about the growth there. Uh, you saw, you know, we're, we're testing new consumption formats inside of Instagram. So it went from just images to video that we were using for a while. We extended the length of video more recently, uh, IG stories and making sure that people could have kind of this daily stream of their friends or brands that they wanted to connect with. Um, but it's a platform that's growing and doing quite well and we're really excited mm -hmm. about. Yeah. So your Oculus VR, uh, yeah. we have in our innovation lab and here are actually a lot of that happening here. So where is that going? How has that been? Yeah, uh, uh, I don't, has anyone, has everyone used VR before? Oh, okay, we need to get these numbers up, right? Because <laughs> I think once you have the virtual reality experience, be it an Oculus or anything else that's out there right now, you truly understand why Facebook puts this on its kind of 10-year vision and 10-year roadmap of what we know we want to, to lean into because we think it is going to be the next big computing platform. Mm -hmm. It may not be in the form that you see today of strapping, you know, kind of right. heavy goggles on your face. Maybe it's just glasses like the one that you have right now mm -hmm. or contacts like I have in my, my eyes right now. Right. But nonetheless, this idea of dropping yourself into this fully immersive experience where um, you know, right now a lot of the content and experiences that you see tend to be around gaming. So I don't know if anyone is a gamer out there, but you know, Oculus is the platform for you right now if it comes to games. Just last week we had our big developer conference called Oculus Connect mm -hmm. 3. And a lot of the themes that Mark talked about was around how we want to continue to lean into more software. Right? We've already, I think, invested over $250 million into developers that are building software for virtual reality. We're going to commit another 250 million more to see more content, more software developers building for that platform, which we continue to think is the future. One of the ones that I'm the most excited about <clears throat> is education. And we talked about how we're going to carve out a special kind of $10 million to truly focus on developers that want to build educational experiences mm -hmm. for VR. As you can imagine, has anyone learned a foreign language before? I took 15 years of Spanish and my conversational Spanish is terrible. It's absolutely <laughs> terrible just because I didn't have the practice. And a lot of the reason why I didn't right. practice growing up was because it was awkward and it was, oh, I don't want to seem like or sound like an idiot in front mm -hmm. of you know, this person who I'm trying to speak Spanish with. But you can imagine an experience where you throw on a, a VR headset and you drop me right into Madrid. And from my couch at home in San Francisco, I can walk around Madrid with a tour guide and practice my Spanish and speak my Spanish. You know, as an adult, I probably will learn Spanish like that more so than when I was in the classroom trying to read it and being embarrassed to kind of raise my hand. So I think about educational experiences like that. I could riff on that forever, but virtual reality, I believe, is just going to be a platform where not only we are going to be able to um, learn, right. but truly connect with other people. The other right. story I like to tell about is I have a, I just, um, I was telling someone backstage, my brother got married. So right. we, took, we took Nigeria to Wyoming this past <laughs> weekend. <laughs> And, you know, it would have been amazing. My, my grandmother, who is over 100 years old, wow. is, is in Abagana, Nigeria, and doesn't travel. But it would have been amazing to be able to throw on a virtual reality headset sure. and have her live the experience out with the rest of the family in the yeah. same way. So, you know, there's experiences like that that I know are just right around the corner if we continue to lean into this technology. Mm -hmm. And that's truly back to our mission of making people connect and be able to share experiences with each other. You talk about hiring, and um, one of the reasons why um, Black Enterprise is even doing this summit mm -hmm. is because of um, introducing African Americans to technology mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, we had a panel yesterday where we talked about diversity mm -hmm. 
And I know Wall Street Journal has recently wrote an article about the low numbers um, for at Facebook. So yeah. talk to us about the initiatives and the efforts that you're taking to close that gap. Yeah, we have work to do as an industry, and this is uh, kind of near and dear to my heart. I mean, mm -hmm. over the course of the last six years that I've been in tech in the Valley, and then clearly over the course of my life being in technology and being, you know, one of a kind, right. uh, you know, as, as I continue to progress in my career, I realize how much more intentional I personally want to be about trying to, to solve and tackle this issue. And then it's been great to see, I would say, just the consciousness around the Valley and definitely around the world mm -hmm. of, of uh, kind of the issues and struggles here. Yeah, like the numbers are out there. There's nothing mm -hmm. to hide. Um, <clears throat> numbers are low, uh, you know, less than 5% industry-wide when it mm -hmm. comes to, you know, blacks and Latinos yep. in, in the industry. And we have a lot of work to do. There is a big component of just trying to, to kind of find more talent. I think there's a bunch of different ways that one can tackle that. That is, how are you looking at, how are you looking at your hiring practices? Are you looking in the right places? Um, it's kind of revisiting as a company what one has to do. Mm -hmm. A bunch of the stuff that we're doing right now, I'd say in kind of this fine bucket is all about trying to invest in the future, right? There's short term and there's long term bets that you can make. We, we just uh, last year, or maybe earlier this year, announced a relationship, uh, an investment in, in code.org which you know, has some pretty aggressive targets of getting people, uh, young people trained in CS uh, for the next five years, mm -hmm. right? And we want to get behind initiatives like that. We have a program called uh, Tech Prep, which is all about demystifying computer science and programming to our communities, not just the kids in our communities and the youth in our communities, but also the adults and the parents, because a lot of folks, uh, you know, their child will be interested in, in computer science or programming, and they go to their parent, who is their typical source of you right. know, pointing them in the right direction. Sure. And if the parent can't point them in the right direction, uh, you know, that's that, that, that curiosity and that, that excitement for programming computer science is lost, so we're trying to fix and correct all of that. Um, we have uh, a bunch of other things that we talk about and like I, I think about internally too. So as a company, it goes once again beyond just finding the talent and getting them into the industry. But once you get them there, how are you keeping them and how are you growing them? That tends to be top of the mind for me right now. I feel like there's enough collective energy right now and enough smart people thinking about the find, how do you invest in the future, how do we increase the pipeline, so on and so forth. But once people get in the door, be it you know, entry level or senior level talent, that once again are coming into an industry where whether they want to admit it or not, they're going to be first of a kind. How are the, the, the companies, how is Facebook thinking about making sure that they have a smooth onboarding and that they can, mm -hmm. that they can grow with this company, that they're finding the right sponsorship and mentorship uh, that we know can be challenges for folks in our community when they're one of a kind. So there's a bunch of components in there that uh, you know, I'm trying to tackle personally. We have a, uh, a black employee resource group, which I'm sure many companies are familiar with. And you know, a lot of our focus these days is on community building and mm -hmm. making sure that the folks that are in the door already understand that they have family there, right? They have folks that, are, that they can go to and are looking out for them that have navigated this company, have navigated this industry before, and that they can lean on to learn from and help kind of grow and advance in their careers. Good. Yeah. So we're almost um, up of time, and we want to get a couple of questions in, but what's the future for Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great question. Um, I don't even have to answer it. I mean, ultimately, Facebook will always come back to this idea that our mission and our, our reason for existence is connecting people and giving people the power to share and staying on the forefront of kind of the tech trends that are going to allow that and enable us to reach that vision is what we will continue to invest in. When we think about kind of our 10 year horizon, we actually do put things like virtual reality on that 10 year horizon, mm -hmm. right? That is technology, like I said, it's a, it's a big machine. You can see back, back, in the, back in the back right now, it's a big machine. Yeah. Um, and for, for that device or for that technology to reach the billions of people in the same way that mobile devices have right now, it's gonna take some time. Uh, there was a panel on AI. We're investing heavily in AI right now. And anyone who's scrolling through their newsfeed already knows that we're taking tens of thousands of stories that we could show you at any one given yeah. time and trying to make sense of it and show you the 10 that are the most important, right? Mm -hmm. We have a bunch of uh, image recognition, speech recognition, and stuff that we're, we're investing in right now. So kind of this AI bucket is another one of those things that we put on this 10-year horizon because we do think it's going to change the way that human beings interact with technology and the ability for people to connect and share. Uh, you talked about internet.org to start. There's a lot of work left to be done there. Uh, the, the, the initiative has probably connected 25 million people that we think otherwise wouldn't have been on the internet before. Mm -hmm. But when you're going after four or five billion to get them on, clearly there's a, there's a wide gap we have to make up there. So that's also kind of in the future in that 10 year horizon of what we think we can get to. 
and then who knows what comes around the corner. Right, that's what something we, new all the time, right? Exactly, we got to have our ears to the ground. Yes. Yeah. So we have any questions in the audience? Can we get the mic? Oh, back here. Uh, good afternoon. Quick question. Um, well, quick question, long answer. Uh, my name is Lyle <laughs> Worden. I work at uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I just hopped on LinkedIn, looked at your background, see that you, um, or saw that you went to Yale and then Stanford. And I've noticed that working in the tech industry, the majority of us who are uh, management level and above, we have Ivy League backgrounds. Well, those of us of color, but you don't see that same background from people from the majority population. Um, what are the tactics that Facebook's using in terms of advancing recruiting outside of that very small uh, group of schools? And then also, what are the plans that Facebook has in terms of working collectively within Silicon Valley and really using its force in terms of being a social change or a social changer, if you will, in terms of uh, identifying talent that's not coming in from these very limited very limited schools in terms of, you know, 500 students known, less than 10% of that, that student body is uh, underrepresented minorities. Thank you. Yeah, great question. I, un I, I, will, I will preface it by saying I do not work on the core recruiting organization or the diversity initiative organization uh, at Facebook, but I have, I would say, personally spent a tremendous amount of time over the course of the last six years thinking about it, trying to be a help where I can be a help. So I have a fairly decent pulse on it, but to get, I think, a more comprehensive one, we could definitely follow up afterwards. In general, I know that um, the, or like the, the recruiting organization over the course of many years, this has been put in place for a while, has definitely widened the corpus of traditional schools that they have recruited from. So I was not recruited to Facebook from Yale nor Stanford. I happened, I told you my journey, and that tends to be, I'd say, the Silicon Valley journey. So in addition to going and being very intentional about making sure we're going and hitting the right schools with our proactive recruiting efforts, I think some of this, which is just how do we make sure that that informal conversation, connections, kind of networks that, that, that bring people to certain organizations is happening. Um, that is us, uh, just two weeks ago, we hosted, are you guys familiar with Dev Color? Okay, so we, we hosted the Dev Color, the first ever Dev Color conference, and that was in large part because McAday, who you know is the kind of the, the inspiration behind that and the person who championed that, uh, was a former Facebooker, knew us, was able to leverage us, and we're like, absolutely, you know, you, you are creating kind of a network of black engineers in Silicon Valley for formal mentorship and career guidance, and if anything, if that's a role that we can play in convening that body and connecting with that community, we want to make sure that we have that and we're doing that. I can't tell you, in addition to my day job, how much time I've spent over the course of the last six years trying to participate in conferences, whether it's something like this, whether it's something like Dev Color, to make sure that those informal networks are starting to get built, because I do think that so much of this is community-based. Right, there are folks out here. The question is, is are people connected? Mm -hmm. And if we can connect people and make sure that we're plugged into those ecosystems, informal ecosystems, I think some of this stuff will naturally happen. So I want to see you know, us continue to be intentional about that and making some of that happen. I forget there was a second part of your question that I probably didn't answer, but. Um, OK, next question, please. I'll find you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. Um, Messenger and WhatsApp both have over a billion users. Yeah. But there doesn't seem to be a clear revenue model. For example, in Asia, you have messaging apps like Talk, Line, uh, WeChat that are generating hundreds of millions of dollars, billions yeah. in value-added services. So what is the uh, revenue model, short-term or long-term, for your messaging platforms? Or is it to go from a million, or excuse me, from one billion to two billion without any revenue? Yeah, no, another good question. I would say, um, yes, both platforms are, are massive at this point, right? You have Messenger, you have WhatsApp, which are both over a billion people. Uh, and the WhatsApp acquisition, one of the things that, you know, Mark had a conversation with, with Jan and, and kind of that founding team, and, you know, part of them joining our mission, which was fairly aligned, right, connecting people and giving people the power to share, was making sure that they had the runway to go and continue to connect not just a billion, but two billion, three billion, four billion. You're seeing Messenger do the exact same thing, too. Uh, we tend, I'd say, have a DNA as a company, which is if we can go and we can connect and kind of uh, make sure that we are on path to hit our mission, finding the right business model to support those products and those programs will be a natural kind of add-on. Um, we will get to a point where I think, as, as Mark thinks about the, the corpus of, of products or businesses that live in Facebook, Inc., um, uh, to a point where we definitely need to try to understand a little bit more about what that business model is, is going to look like for our messaging ecosystem. Is it transactional? Is it advertising-based, which is kind of our core business and our DNA and what we know? I think it's somewhat TBD. 
we'll probably start experimenting more with stuff in Messenger. I don't know if, you, if you're using both products right now. What you probably see is from a product innovation standpoint, uh, Messenger tends to be like leading the charge and, and, and pushing out a lot faster. They launch something, I mean, I feel like every three weeks, uh, where WhatsApp will then look at the Messenger ecosystem, see what's happening, and probably port some of the, the best practices and, and stuff over there. But, but to your point, we have, I'd say, some runway. They're still focused on their mission of getting people connected. We have some time to figure out what the right business model is to support them. Okay. Yeah. One more question. So I'm one of the students who um, didn't have a, a, a great background from the beginning and then ended up uh, going to Harvard University uh, later. Uh, I had uh, a grandmother who could barely uh, read, and she instilled on me to, to work as hard as I possibly could. And so my biggest focus has been education. So what would you recommend to people who just say, for instance, they, they can't afford to come to this conference, but they're looking for local resources to uh, basically do whatever they need to do to get into tech or to get into any kind of uh, business uh, environment to, to, to be where we are today. So would you recommend like local initiatives or you know, going to community colleges? I'm, I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, no, it's a great question and I appreciate you sharing your background. I mean, similar, you know, grandmother, you know, Nigeria, second grade, I'd say formal education. And I think one of the things that her and my grandfather instilled in my parents who you know, flew across an ocean to make sure that they could follow their educational dreams because they knew that was going to unlock the future for us and they set us up for, for what we now are doing um, is, is to be bold, right? And to take those risks. It's funny, I, I met with, um, we have a program called uh, FBU, which is just Facebook University and it's geared towards making sure we can identify underrepresented minorities and women and get them into tech early or get them excited about the industry early in their college career. And I still won't, I will not forget this woman's name. Uh, sorry, I won't forget her story. Uh, but years ago, when we had probably 17 or 15 students, she was a woman from Puerto Rico, uh, you know, had the ability to go to private school, I think her freshman, sophomore, and junior year of high school. Come senior year, parents lost their job. So she was no longer able to go to this private high school, which was on the path of teaching and computer science, which she was excited about. So she had to go to public school, didn't have access to that. But because she had kind of this bold intention that she wanted Passion. to, uh, she, yeah, she, she, she went after it. She learned all she needed to learn about comp sci online, right? Wow. This is, this is the beauty of being connected right now. So if you are out there and you have access to a computer, whether it's at your local library, whether it's at home, whether it's your mobile device, there are so many tools right now that exist out there that can give you the foundation of entering the tech space right now. She went on, took that online education. She was enrolled at Stanford as a result of that. You know, spent some time at Facebook doing an internship, and I'm sure she's doing fantastic right now in her career, but it's truly kind of that motivation that she had, self-starter attitude to go and find it, and you can find a lot of this stuff online. Techprep.org is our initiative to actually mm -hmm. get some of this stuff out there and make sure that as a student, you know where your local resources are uh, to learn about computer science and to learn about programming. So I would point kind of anyone who feels like they don't have access to kind of formal instruction to, to check out Tech Prep and go there first and foremost. Yeah, thanks for your question. Thank you. So we're at the end, unfortunately. We probably so could have sat up here and talked for a good, a good another half an hour, hour, but we really would like to thank you for you know, spending time with us. I know, we know you're very, very busy, awesome. you know, awesome. um, and we can't wait to come back to Facebook yeah. again. Hey, okay. we're always <laughs> back. Any of you guys are welcome. Let me know. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you.